Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to worship at Calvary United Methodist Church on this last day of June. Um, I think the announcements are pretty self-explanatory in the bulletin. I believe that the advanced special that you see there, number 223, is also in response to the flooding. So that if you want to give toward that, I think all that disaster relief gets divided where it's needed most. Those were our old stomping grounds up in the Spencer area in northwest Iowa. And just looking at the gas pumps at the Casey's I used to go to being underwater was just uh, really incredible. So those things, we scroll past them in our news feed or we watch them on the news for a week or two. And then they kind of get swept away, just like things got swept away in the floodwaters. But those people are going to be climbing out of these disasters uh, for months and months. So your generosity is much appreciated. Every dollar helps and every little bit helps. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of cleanup teams that are heading up there as well to help people climb out of all that. So thank you for your generosity. And I heard last week that the generosity for the shoes has been really amazing from Calvary. So if you want to continue to give to that, right? Um, they're buying name brand back to, school, back to school shoes for kiddos as part of the uh, Hope in Christ Back to School project. So that is still something you can designate on your check memo or put a note on your envelope or whatever works best for you there. But um, Calvary Generosity continues to be one of your greatest gifts and one of the gifts of the Spirit that you are using well. We continue our series on the fruit of the Spirit today, and I stand before you as the reason that Steve has to preach on patience. So uh, that is our fruit that we talk about today. Uh, thankfully, we made a pact early in the marriage that he would not use me as a sermon illustration without my permission. <laughs> so <laughs> I have not given any authorization for any sermon illustrations today. So. Anyway, we will continue on with patience, which is probably one of the most difficult things for us to be able to deal with because our tendency tends to be so focused on ourselves and our impatience is usually because we want our needs met before the needs of someone else. So it is an important thing to be talking about. It's not just the patience of waiting, but it's the patience in relationships and how we are willing to uh, forbear with one another. So from Psalm 103, this is one of my favorites, and this is from the Amplified Bible, the first couple of verses. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is deep within me, bless his holy name. Bless and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul, and do, for, do not forget any of his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you lavishly with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the soaring eagle. Isn't that beautiful, the way that that is put in there? So even those of us who are older, we can have our inner youth renewed like that of the soaring eagle when we are blessing and affectionately praising the Lord. And that leads us into uh, the first hymn in the United Methodist hymnal, number 57, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, and someday we will hear the praises of God in every language from every tribe and every people and every nation, and we will join together uh, singing our great Redeemer's praise. So please stand if you're able, number 57, the first six verses. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus, you are our great Redeemer. You are the one who breaks the power of sin in our lives and gives us new life. Lord, we pray that today you will fill us with hope, fill us with joy, fill us with peace and patience, knowing that you love us, that you forgive our sins, and when we come to you, we come to open arms. So Lord, we come to you this morning in worship. Help us to glean exactly what it is you have for each and every one of us here, because you meet us where we are at our point of need, through the giving of your word, and the preaching, and the singing together. So we pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I think we are kidless today, so we will move on to our scripture lesson. Sorry, I'm waiting for some sort of an update on this Bible app. Steve, do you have your scripture here? I wasn't expecting that this morning. It worked just a moment ago. This is from Matthew 18, verses 20. The back screen is not on either, so. Verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Oh, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord, and this we believe. One of the things I hate uh, about preaching is that uh, God somehow expects me to practice what I preach. And, and so sometime during the, the course of preparing a sermon, uh, it, it seems as if God often um, tests me on these things. So we were uh, driving somewhere on Friday, um, and you know how it is sometimes when you're driving in Ames, uh, in this particular case, someone cut us off in traffic. And I don't know what comment I made, but my wife said, uh, what fruit of the spirit are you on this week? <laughs> okay, okay. Be patient. Uh, speaking of uh, my wife, uh, today is her birthday, uh, and she is often patient with me. <laughs> Uh, during the course of things, and so wish her happy birthday sometime today. Uh, patience is a relatively unpopular virtue. It's the kind of virtue that we think everyone else should have, uh, but we don't think we really need to develop it ourselves. 
After all, we have a right to be impatient with the person who cuts us off in traffic or that loudmouth jerk who cut in front of us in the checkout line or with the stupid people who don't see things our way. Besides, if we ever do think that we need to develop patience, we don't like the process that develops it. It's not an instant process. You know, in our society, we, we want things now. It's instant. And so if we, if we think we need patience in our lives, often we tell God, I want patience and I want it now. We don't want to go through the process. But patience is not something that comes instantly. Patience is developed only when it is tested. In fact, we don't need patience if it isn't tested. Now, who needs to be patient if everyone agrees with us and no one bothers or offends us or has any uh, irritating habits and everything is going our way? Don't need it. So patience is one characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit that we might be content to live without. But patience is not one of the fruits of the Spirit, plural. It is a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, singular. So we can't decide which of the, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, we uh, will practice and which we will not. We can't just say, well, we'll develop love, joy, and peace, and we'll pass on patience. Patience is part of the package. If the Holy Spirit is in us, then patience should be evident in our lives. It, it should be developing. It doesn't mean that we're completely patient yet. Uh, we, uh, I, I remember back, I think it was in the 70s, where there was a, there was a button that people used to wear or uh, a bumper sticker that said, be patient with me, God isn't finished with me yet. And so uh, we have to develop patience with each other. And let's face it, patience is necessary because there will always be people who disagree with us, bother or offend us or irritate us, and things won't always go our way. In our scripture passage from Matthew this morning, Jesus tells a parable that illustrates how serious God is about the need for patience in our life. Matthew places this parable uh, in the context of Jesus' teaching about church discipline and a question that Peter poses to Jesus. In verses 15 through 20 of Chapter 18, Jesus taught that if your brother or sister uh, sins against you, uh, you are to go to him or her in private and um, settle the matter. And if your brother or sister listens to you, then, then you've won that brother or sister back. But then that gets Peter to thinking, uh, what if my brother or sister keeps messing up? Which of the, what if they keep offending me? What if they see my point, recognize their sin, apologize, but then they go on sinning against me? They, they keep messing up. How patient do I have to be with them? How, how long do I have to put up with this? So in verse 21, he asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, I'm sure that Peter thought he was being generous. I mean, after all, forgiving someone for the same offense two or three times can stretch one's patience. In fact, you can stretch it to the breaking point. Forgiving someone seven times seems like a Herculean display of patience. How much more can someone expect? But Jesus' response must have stunned Peter and the rest of the disciples, for that matter, who were listening in. 
He says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, depending on the Bible you, you use, um, there, there's different wording there, but that's because the Greek here is ambiguous. It, it could be translated 77 times, as it is in uh, the ESV, English Standard Version, or 70 times seven in some, uh, and some versions of the Bible uh, translate it that way. And that would mean that, that we must forgive 490 times, which is a lot more than 77. But if you're doing the math, you're missing the point. Jesus is using a figure of speech. It's kind of like when your mother told you, I, I've told you a thousand times not to hit your sister. It's, it's, it's an exaggeration. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a figure of speech. The point is, the point that Jesus is trying to make is don't count. Don't, don't do the math. Just forgive and keep forgiving. We aren't supposed to keep count. We're not, we're not supposed to tell our friend, uh, look, I've forgiven you 489 times. The next one is the last one. No, Jesus says, you just keep forgiving. Don't do the math. And then Jesus launches into a story that illustrates his point and shows us how important God views this idea of forgiving each other, being patient with each other. As the story goes, a king decided that he was going to settle accounts with his servants. And while he was doing this, he came across one of his servants uh, who owed him a huge amount of money. He owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents was an absurdly high amount of money. It was roughly equivalent to $10 million. It was more than the total annual revenue of a wealthy province, let alone a servant. How did the servant accumulate such a debt? Well, Jesus doesn't say, and it probably doesn't matter to the story. But there is an indication that this servant may be one of the agents that the king sent out to collect revenue, his IRS agent. Perhaps the servant had been skimming for some for himself. So if, if that's true, he's not only a debtor, but he's a scoundrel. So he really owes the king big time. It was pretty clear that to the king that there was no way under the sun that this, this servant is going to pay back this debt. This, this is way too much. So he ordered that the man, his wife, and children, and all his possessions be sold to pay down the debt. So you might say this is the ultimate foreclosure. Now, the servant was understandably distraught at such a prospect. So he, he fell to his knees and he began to beg for more time. He says, have patience. There's that word. Have patience with me, he says, and I will pay you everything. Now, this guy is either extremely optimistic or he's delusional. Because he's not going to be able to pay that back. He's not going to be able to pay that back in several lifetimes, let alone in, in, in the, the, the time he's thinking of. He'll never make good on that debt. What kind of fool does he think the king is? Something remarkable happens here. The king takes pity on the servant. He doesn't just give him more time to pay up. He, he cancels the debt. 
this huge debt. He tears up the legal papers and he tells the servant, you're free to go. Can you imagine the relief that he's feeling? I mean, I, I, I've been in debt, not this much, but I've been in heavy debt. And when I have finally paid that off, I just feel great. The load that's lifted off of me. I, I imagine that this, this guy felt a hundred pounds lighter when he left the room. He might have been floating out of the room, <laughs> off, off the ground. He might have been singing as he left. Now, if the, if the story ends here, now it, it would be the feel-good story of the year. But the story doesn't end here. The man is barely out of the king's chamber when he spots a man who owes him a hundred denarii. Now, that's about $20, and that was a pretty substantial amount back then for a person to have that kind of debt. But it's not nearly as great as the debt that this man was forgiven just moments ago. And the servant then is furious, and he begins to shake the man down, literally. He, he grabs him by the throat, and he says, pay up. And the debtor fell to his knees and begged, have patience. That word again. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. Now that action and those words should have seemed familiar to the servant. Because he had done the, and said the same thing, just merely patient with us. He doesn't treat us um, as we deserve to be treated. Praise his name. Since God has shown an extraordinary amount of patience toward us, and since patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, God expects us to be patient with each other. And patience means forgiving one another. But it also means forbearance with others. Forbearance means putting up with the things other people do or don't do that you wish they did. Patience means putting up with that person who irritates you or annoys you. It means being patient with the person who cut me off in traffic. It means being patient with the people close to you who do irritating things or don't do the things you expect them to do. Patience means choosing to forgive others instead of holding a grudge against them. Patience means choosing to overlook a hurtful or unkind remark or action rather than getting even. We need to exercise patience because we should be painfully aware of our own shortcomings and weaknesses. We need to be aware that there might be things in us that other people have to be patient with because we're not perfect. Patience is a virtue that is easier to contemplate in theory than it is to put into practice. There's a little poem that says it well. To dwell in love with saints above, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. There was a philosopher or entertainer, I can't remember uh, who it was exactly, said, you know, uh, I love mankind as people that I can't stand. It's the people who are close to us that it's harder to be patient with. 
patience, like all the parts of the fruit of the Spirit, requires work on our part. Yes, it's what God puts in us, it produces in us, but we cultivate it. The scriptures bear witness to this and urge us to exercise patience. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. And then in Ephesians 4, uh, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So it's not that we just grit our teeth I'm not sure that's really patience. We bear with them in love because we love this person. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, we read, bear with, one, with, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against anyone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Very important. Always remembering how much we have been forgiven, how patient God is with us as we deal with other people. Now there's one, there's another important aspect of the fruit of patience um, that I don't have time to develop this morning, but I, I do need to mention it. Now, patience is not only forgiveness and forbearance, but it is also long-suffering. And in fact, if you use the King James Version uh, in the fruit of the Spirit, uh, it, it lists, instead of patience, long-suffering. What is long-suffering? Well, it's, it's bearing up under persecution. Jesus warned his disciples that they, would be, uh, that they would face persecution because they were his followers. It just, it goes with the territory, like it or not. Patience is, as fruit of the Holy Spirit, means the ability to endure for a long time whatever opposition and suffering may come simply because we are Christians. Jesus said, I, I, I've been persecuted. The world's against me. It hates me. They're going to hate you because they're going to hate me in you. And we bear up under this without wanting retaliation or revenge. The Bible teaches that God's people will suffer from the hostility of those who are enemies of God and God's people. These enemies may be human, or they may be demonic, or they may be both. In fact, they probably are both. What is important is not only that we suffer for Christ's sake, but also how we endure that suffering. Listen to how uh, Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, and then verse 16 and 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes, not if it comes, when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So we don't just put up with suffering uh, just to, to grit it out uh, or to be stoic about it, but we rejoice in suffering, not for suffering's sake, but because there's glory on the other side. God, Jesus endured the cross 
because he saw the glory on the other side of that. So Peter continues, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So when we're enduring this suffering, we're not just gutting it out, we are seeing it as something that's testing us, uh, purifying us, uh, taking us to, to glory. We're going to be with Christ because uh, we are suffering along with him. The message from these verses is clear. When Christians suffer because we are Christians, we should not be surprised. Jesus said it's going to happen. So when we face persecution, we just know that comes with the territory. We must not retaliate because we follow the example of Christ who did not fight back himself, not even with words. Though he could have called down an army of angels to fight for him. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when the disciples were, were starting to resist um, those who had come to arrest Jesus, he said, I can call 10,000 angels to rescue me. But this, this is part of the plan. So we must not quit because when we commit our cause to God, we do not sit back and wait, but we continue to do, do the good that God has called us to do. The Apostle Paul reinforces the certainty of persecution for those who follow Christ and the importance of patient endurance. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, he writes, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings, that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if you, if you choose to be godly, if you choose to follow Jesus, you will be persecuted. Maybe not to the extent that some people in the world are, but you're going to have at least be laughed at, ridiculed. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and follow him as your Lord, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit's in you. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then you have the power to bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which includes patience. So it's really no good to try to excuse yourself here. Because some people might say, well, you know, just, I'm an impatient person. That's just how I'm wired. And my answer to that is, that may have been how you were wired, but if you're in Christ and, you're in the, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then you've been rewired. So it's just a matter of, of acting from this rewiring. You are called to bear the fruit of patience in your life. Forbearance toward other people, forgiving them when they have wronged you and putting up with their idiosyncrasies and long-suffering, patiently enduring suffering for being a Christian because those who endure to the end will be glorified. There's a reward for exercising patience. 
We cannot choose which characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit we will work on and which we will neglect. It's part of the package. Whether we like it or not, patience is one of those characteristics. And when you come to think of it, don't you hope that other people are exercising this fruit of the Spirit when they're dealing with you? So, let us continue to develop this fruit in our lives. It's it's not about just sitting back and letting the Holy Spirit do all the work. We help to cultivate this fruit. And what a, what a glorious uh, church we will have, what glorious families we will have if we are exercising this characteristic of the fruit of spirit. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your patient endurance of us. We are so grateful that you were slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. At least we're grateful that you are patient with us. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for sometimes wondering why you're so patient with other people. Sometimes we we want people to to pay immediately for their sins, especially their sins against us. But you're patient with them too. And so we're grateful. We're grateful for this gift of grace that you've given us. And we're grateful, Jesus, that you endured suffering, that you were long-suffering in your the persecution that you endured so that you would go to the cross and take our sins with you. It is because of the cross, Lord, that that we can stand before you forgiven. So help us. Help us to develop patience with each other. The kind of patience that is supernatural and comes from the Holy Spirit. Bless us, O Lord, in these days ahead with the knowledge of your patience with us and the need for our patience with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. And in his name, we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn today continues in um, a spirit of prayer, so I ask you to join in with number 430, O Master, let me walk with thee, and we'll see that there is a verse about patience and um, just reminding us that good will triumph and that our Master is indeed walking with us. Number 430, O Master, let me walk with thee.
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope.